guys please meet Lydia Yuknovich? <laughs> there is no other literary voice like Lydia Yuknovich's. She's a bold and ecstatic writer, a writer's writer, a trailblazing literary voice that spans genres and dives deep. The author of the award-winning speculative feminist novel, The Book of Joan, and the hypnotic memoir, The Chronology of Water, has experienced domestic violence, struggles with substance use, bouts of homelessness, and the loss of a child. In a raw, fearless voice, she interrogates conformity, love, sex, the body, memory, and writing itself, and inspires her readers with the courage to live and write fully. A protege of Ken Kesey and inspired by Kathy Acker, she's a self-proclaimed misfit and has penned a book enhanced by interviews called The Misfits Manifesto. Come hear her calls for authenticity in life and literature. I probably wasn't supposed to read that part. <laughs> it's fine. Let me tell you a couple other things before I introduce myself. Um, if you haven't already silenced your cell phone or pager, please take a moment to do that now. And, and about me. Uh, my name is Daphne Gottlieb. I am a... Oh, hey, pal. Um, I am a writer. I've got about 10 books in about 10 different genres, um, mostly interested in feminism, transgression, um, and sex. So I am, I am honored to be here with <laughs> Lydia, um, who doesn't know this, but I'm about to tell her, which is that I had the experience when I was reading on The Small Blacks of Children that that book was written for me. Unquestionably, it was, it was my book, and I loved it so much, I did not read the last three or four pages, because I did not want it to end. Oh. So thank you for your book. It has thank meant you. so much to me. That's so meaningful to me. Most people are scared of that book. <laughs> so thank you. It makes me like you a lot. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so this entire festival is under the theme of the power to revolutionize hearts and minds. A lot of the writers over this weekend are explicitly political. That's their, that's their jam. Um, so I'm wondering how you contextualize your work in the broader tradition of activist writing, um, and how do, for you, how do you situate creative work within a tradition of activism? Yeah, well, we're in an area of the country where you grow up, you know, the boob milk has activism in it, <laughs> so there's that. Um, but, I think I come from the sort of ground up version where um, to stand up and grab a voice at all is the political act um, for people like probably a lot of people in this room who came up and through abusive households, for women, for people of color, for indigenous people. Um, LGBTQ plus people, <laughs> um, prisoners, mentally different people, uh, mental, I mean, differently abled people, to, to, you know, to even deign to step into a voice or move into a voice itself is the political act. And then to tell your story is to kind of rupture a cut through culture against the grain of who we're told to be and how we're told to act. And, and so, as a person who writes, I also draw and paint, but that's more private. But they're forms of inscription. They're all forms of inscription, including tattoos. I'm all covered up. <laughs> I want to take all my clothes off so I can... I have that effect on people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I guess I think writing, storytelling, in the oldest definitions, in most indigenous definitions, in and of itself, making representation, creating story, in the service of one's community, is the politics. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. Oh, <laughs> good. <laughs> I think they do, too. Um, I think that leads to, to another question I have for you, which is that activism sort of belongs to the present and the future, at least theoretically, but you are an activist to the past. That is to say, by recreating Dora, who's, you know, Freud's Dora, who is a hysteric, who can't speak, suddenly she becomes this punk rock provocateur who's, who's 
a badass, and by taking um, Joan of Arc, who, who's best known for you know, hearing voices and marching into battle, and making her a lover, you change the course of history. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess I wanted to, to, speak to speak to history and speak what, what effect these revisions have and why you're drawn to it in your work. I'm so mesmerized by what this thing we call history, you know, this thing we pretend is history, like everybody agreed on it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the people that got left out didn't agree on it. Uh, but I'm, I'm mesmerized by history, and I'm, so I'm kind of a closet history nerd. But the thing that fascinates me as an artist is the act of um, dislocating and relocating, um, as if you could do that. And so there are so many figures and voices and bodies that have been important to me in my own life that come behind me, like we're standing on the bones of so many people who made it possible for us to even have a life, right? And so I love the idea of dislocating them from, especially when the story they're in is, has a lock on it. Do you, raise your hand if there are historical figures that are super meaningful to you and you feel like they're locked in a box and you wish you could let them out. That feeling. And so in fiction, you can do that. You can <laughs> um, stage a break-in go get them. And in those books, the Dora book, her name was Ida Bauer. I just like saying that out loud. And she quit therapy with Freud. I don't think everybody knows that. This is his teen patient after whom he kind of wrote a famous treatise on hysteria. And she quit. <laughs> She's like, whatever, dude. Which is how I met, she so clearly became a punk person in Seattle to me. She's like, talk to the hand. <laughs> that was really loud, sorry. Um, what, what fascinates me about liberating them or relocating these people or figures is not that I'm going to get the correct account in my story. I'm not even trying to get the correct account. I'm just trying to remind us we have imaginations and that these figures are never locked and dead inside something static called history, but they could rise over and over again. If it helps us change, then they could rise whenever we want them to, and they could be anything we want them to be, particularly in the arts, in fiction and plays. There's a play across the street that's doing a really good job at reminding us we have imaginations and that we can change on any day doesn't matter how bad it gets, the next day we could change. And so that's my fascination with it. Also, I, I fall in love with those women from the past deeply. <laughs> which, which you are anticipating everything I'm going to ask you, actually, because my next question is when you take, this brings together sort of all your work, because uh, I can't remember who said that we're true to our obsessions, but you know, uh, Joan is absolutely a misfit. Yeah. And Dora is absolutely a misfit. Yeah. And you are probably best known for Misfits Manifesto, but I, I can go through every book of yours. And she, and um, I think always she, is always outside. Always she, yes. And is always outside. Yes, so, so I'm not the first artisty person who's attracted to the outsider figure. <laughs> right? That's like all of us everywhere all the time. <laughs> so, so that's not new and I'm a part of a great tribe in that way, but I'm even deeper interested in even the, the people um, beyond the outsider role who just kind of couldn't quite get their shoes on, right? <laughs> or um, just, just literally, um, I did a TED talk about this, that word misfit is really connotatively and denotatively important to me because it's so perfect. It's this slippage is missing. If you think of the fit as the well-adjusted social person <laughs> with an intact and stable identity marching around like everything's fine, <laughs> the miss, you know, the slipped person who just couldn't fit the story has to make a story up just to exist. And so, so I'll be endlessly in love with those people um, on any street, anywhere in my life, 
in history, in my imagination, that person who's just never going to fit the story. So the downside of that is they'll feel like the outsider, yeah, but the upside is they'll be inventing every day of their lives, and that's beautiful to me. Which leads us to an interesting place, because they are, your heroines, transgressors. They are always violating some more, some boundary, some, some something, and even geography. They're, they're across that uh, nation. Yep. So they are always excessive in, in you know, Sisu, Clement, Irigure. Oh, sense. yeah. Yeah. Um, Siksu is another her heroine of mine, so is Eric or I. <laughs> um, and I think they are kind of misfitty too, although with lipstick. These are, these are French deconstruction feminist folks. Very snappy dressers. <laughs> <laughs> um, that transgression idea, though, all the heroines being transgressors of some sort. Uh, you don't have to agree with me, but I'd be curious to know of the women in the room or people who identify in that code, uh, raise your hand if you've ever felt like in order to be your fullest you, like you 110%, you with the volume all the way up, everything you know secretly about yourself, raise your hand if you feel like that would transgress some cultural code that you know of. Raise your hand if that's true. I knew it. <laughs> so that's a lot. So what that means is we're walking around like this. And I'm pretty sure Carl Sagan put me in the world to help people loosen that grip. I, you know, that's a lot. Most of you raised your hand. So why are we doing that? For whom? Why? Because what might happen? Harm might come to us, harm comes to us anyway, right? Um, you might get arrested and thrown in jail. Been there, I lived. You might cross some cultural code so badly you end up homeless and with not great teeth, been there. That's why I smile like this. <laughs> so having been the person that got spit out a few times, I happen to know the thing we're afraid might happen to us if we lived fully as women, whatever that means, and let go of whatever the stories coming toward us are, it can't be worse than what's already happening to us. It can't be. So what the fuck? <laughs> I have berets back there. <laughs> I'm starting an army if you're interested. <laughs> I found my first recruit. <laughs> it's true. Um, so I'd feel, I think I'd feel remiss if, if I didn't mention the fact that it's not just you who's a writer, but also your characters are scribes and documentarians, whether it's in paint or in a play or in written things or on the skin, burning into the skin right. um, a story. So why? Okay. <laughs> Okay, I love this question. Good. I love this question so hard, but I'm not gonna answer it until you answer. Like, can you answer why? Absolutely. Okay, lay it on me. Because... It... I like it, this drop fell off, it's good. Just oh, it. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why that? Yeah. Um, because it's an ongoing journal. It is a, at a moment in time, I need to mark the moment in time. And it's not that the picture has a chronological relationship with it, where I am in my life at that moment, but it's that I need to physicalize the experience that I'm having of something. I believe you. Good. That's kind of the answer for me too. These women that I conjure or make up or try to put in motion through story are trying to write themselves back to life. And so if, if you don't know who the hell I am, I have a bunch of stories. I'm used to going in a room where no one has any idea who I am. I have a bunch of women characters who either they make films or they, they burn things on their body the way she just described, or they're historians or documentarians, and they, so they're always writing, some form of writing or inscribing. 
And, and so the fast answer is that they're trying to write themselves back to life in a way their culture deadened them. So that's one answer. And then the other answer is I'm just obsessed with representation from the earliest things on cave walls to what a person will do when they're incarcerated just to represent, to keep a story alive so they don't die, to um, refugee people trying to tell each other stories when they've been so radically and violently displaced that a sense of self and community and family is like a story disappearing. Um, so I'm, I'm equally obsessed with just the motion of representation and, you know, oceans help us if they take that away from us too. The ability to story oneself or one's community uh, is how we keep each other alive. Like yeah. that. <laughs> I don't know if you've been out to Angel Island here at all for the internment camp, but there are poems written all over it's so the inside. Amazing. Yeah. What's it's scrawled on walls is um, around the world uh, is a testament to both our beauty and our barbarism, for sure. Yeah. More scrawling. Um, Dorothy Allison once said that to write from memory and this is pretty much in, in reference to your, your memoir, um, that in order to write from memory, you have to be prepared to give, give the story away since you will inevitably oh, right, change right, right. the story as you recreate it and try and make it more literary, more perfect, more yep. correct somehow. You know, you can't have <clears throat> facile, um, easy, cute things. You have to actually disrupt the story sometimes to make, break it, to make it work, and you will inevitably change your memory. Yes. And so I was wondering what your experience with that has been. Well, we're hilarious creatures. <laughs> Actually, the second you tell a story of yourself about anything, even at a dinner party or something, you become very dramatic. And you're an awesome character in your own story. <laughs> Whereas in your life, you, it might have been a little bit meh. <laughs> but when you begin to narrate, you're a spectacular character, right? Um, but the more interesting part of your question is about memory and um, because, let's see, zip through this, Lydia, tell the fast version. Because my father, who was our abuser, lost his memory when he drowned in the ocean, like poof. And because trying to live with that after the fact, of all abuse, there was nothing and this sweet, kind man was in its place who had a damaged memory. I had to go learn everything I could learn about what memory is. And so that took like a decade. I'm still learning, but I focused on it for about a decade. And it turns out biochemically and in terms of neuroscience, memories don't work anything like we pretend they do at all. They're not stable. They come from different parts of the brain functioning together and zapping each other. And it's only when we get to the part where there's language and narration that we make sentences and story and narrative. And then it's cohesive and it comes out as a tale. But in your body, memories, fragments and jolts and pieces of things and retinal flashes. And this is true. The second time you tell a memory, every subsequent Subsequent telling changes it. I know some of you don't want to believe that, but I could tape you and prove it. And it would be really embarrassing for you because you'd see. <clears throat> and so what is that? Doesn't that destabilize memory forever? Doesn't that mean it was always storytelling and always will be? And then it moves? And you know, if you go to a dreaded Thanksgiving dinner with family, <laughs> And then each person tells a story of what happened that night. They wouldn't look anything like each other. Right? So whose memory is correct? Mine, clearly. <laughs> I know. See, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Lisa, my, it's our memories. We're correct. They can all go to hell. But you know what I mean. Family members will tell different stories of the same event. And that doesn't mean one of you's right and one of you's wrong. It means memories at work. 
So that fascinates me. It's also a little terrifying if memory isn't stable ever then the distinctions we make about it are kind of tricky. And the people we condemn. You know, um, one of my favorite lines I read about memory science says, the safest memories are locked in the brains of people who have memory loss. Think, think it through for a second. They're pristine, they're untouched. Whereas we're walking around thinking, I got the memory. Well, I'm going to be 55. I, my memory's shot to shit. I don't have any memory anymore. But you know what I mean. We think we have the memories, but really, it would, the one that would survive would be the one that's never retold, never changed, never storied. And that, that just screws me up for life. I'm going to think about that the rest of my life. Which means it would be the things that you'd never told anyone? That are Lodged stable, somewhere. kind of safe. Right. Yeah. And they'd have to be things that you sequestered, that you were ashamed of, or um, frightened of, or so the, the truest things we hold are, are monstrous, essentially. Right. But back to your question and the beloved Dorothy Allison. <laughs> um, when we don't share them, more of us walk around feeling isolated and wrong and in pain and like we're the only ones, and we're gonna die. And when you do share them, when you risk letting them go, like she says, you have to risk saying it's not mine anymore, I'm letting it go, I'm, I'm releasing it to the world. You're making a medicine possibility, you're making a narrative medicine possibility for other mammals to feel less dislocated. And that's worth it. Yeah. So what do you do with the fact that I think that writing memoir is dangerous in a very different way than writing fiction or poetry or anything else is because you're, you are putting yourself out there in a much more immediate way. I mean, all writing is autobiography, but in writing memoir, you're taking very personal things and putting them out very personally. And for me, when I do write autobiography, it's, it's terrifying and sometimes there are consequences to writing autobiographically. Yeah, I'm trying to decide what I think right now, like right this second. <laughs> it's changed for me. I would have said that mm -hmm. a decade ago. Mm -hmm. I would have said nonfiction is m more risky mm -hmm. or dangerous or something like that. And since I do both interchangeably and I cross material a lot too, yep. actually, I'm not sure it's true for me anymore. I mean, I feel equally exposed on the page in fiction where my imagination has been mapped out for you and all my drives and all my dream material and, and erotic <laughs> material and image is right there in your <laughs> and whereas when I'm doing nonfiction, well, let me think about that. I, don't, I no longer feel exposed. I did, I did it first, I admit it. When Chronology of Water first came out, I was unprepared for what came toward me. The wave that came toward me scared the crap out of me. But I'm not sure I feel the same way now that I see that the releasing mm -hmm. was always the thing to do and the holding on to it and calling it mine was killing me. So maybe I, maybe I don't feel more exposed. Maybe I don't feel like it's more dangerous. Maybe I feel like it's representation that gives you any freedom at all. And that why we're walking around thinking our private stories are oh so magical anyway. I mean, face, you're all writing yourselves on Facebook and social media, so everyone's exposed now. Yep. I'll go home and think about it some more. Okay. I'll call you. Okay. I'm you know, still I, thinking through that question. You know, I think, I think that for me personally, the, the costs haven't been internal, I mean, they haven't been external as much as they've been internal in terms of shame and all sorts of other things that have been, or that I could have hurt someone else or all the, all the craziness of my own mind rather Got than you. real world consequences. So, so it didn't, I mean, I came to this point where holding it in was hurting me more than putting it out, which is the day I started writing it, when I figured that out. So there was that. 
the hurting other people thing, I do think about that all the time in nonfiction, and I do struggle mightily to not use writing to do that. But that is a hard one. Yeah. Um, so I read over there that we're talking about fearlessness, and um, one of the things that, that I find incredibly fearless about you is you're writing about sex. You write a sex scene like nobody writes a sex scene. <laughs> and you make what would be considered, I think, um, alternative sexuality or um, aberrant sexuality or BDSM sexuality or non-vanilla sexuality or however you want to you know, name it. What I've been surprised by in your work is that it's not shocking and it's not fetishistic in the wrong, bad fetishistic way. Yeah. It is, it is part of the warp and woof of your, your, the piece that I'm reading, and it gives me more insight into the character instead of staring at her ass, you know. Right. 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 <laughs> not that staring at her ass is bad. No, there, asses too, are but. good. <laughs> but you mean the objects, objectification and projection of creature of desire. Um, yeah, I'm not interested in that at all. What I am interested in is that the idea that sexuality is one of those things locked in a box and the scripts we've been fed about how to be a well-adjusted mammal in culture when it comes to sexuality, you know, there's scripts to follow and they're, they're bullshit. <laughs> they're like crazy. <laughs> if you just laid them out on a piece of paper, it would be shockingly terrible. Um, I'm, I'm as interested in sexuality on the page as the entire landscape of a novel, like what world is it in? Uh, how does the sexuality of an individual person um, tell the story of their life, not just when they're getting it on, but you know, how is washing the dishes part of your sexuality? How is uh, gardening part of your sexuality? How is every piece of your life part of your sexual energy and matter in the world? And therefore, I'm never, I'm never reduced to a single sex scene on page 17 where they turn the lights off and somebody enters someone else. Because it's like sexuality is an entire lexicon. It's an entire landscape. It's an entire world. And, if we, and we know that. We actually know that. But we forget. Or we get scared. Or we get smaller. Um, and I just, I, if there are any writers in the room who would like to join that effort of liberating sexuality, not the sex scene, that is a consumer item that's this big. But if there are any writers or artists in the room who, who would want to liberate sexuality into all its possibilities, please hurry. <laughs> <laughs> it's urgently needed. But I think I just, I look at what is sexuality so differently than what is a sex scene and on what page are the characters going to have some, mm -hmm. which doesn't interest me at all. Yes. And I think that one of the things that I was trying to get at is that there's no shock value when I read it. That was strangely absent. Good. Um, <laughs> because... It doesn't other, and it doesn't... Right. Yeah. Right. Um, it's just we've used the writing about sex and sexuality so badly for so long that um, radical revisions have to take place. And it is true that sex sells in this country. Probably we've, we've <clears throat> perfected that motion. We're at the zenith of the commodification of selling sex. And to break that back down is hard. And to bring it back to individual bodies and what it is, I'm sorry I'm pointing at you, man. <laughs> your body. To bring it to whatever it is, your body firing in the universe and the relationship of your physical presence in the universe as a sexual creature, that's a much more fascinating question. That's why it never comes out like shocking or Oh my God, the sex scene on this certain page is so... I mean, it's just our bodies firing in the universe instead of 
a fetishized, like you're saying, or objectified nodule. So let's flip this over. And if we're talking about sexual assault or assault um, in your work, what's interesting to me is in chronology, I feel like you are looking through water at something that you can't quite reach. It's, it's named, but it's not right. articulated in the same way. And I find that that's true of a lot of violence in your work. And it has the impact of as if, sorry, Mike, as if it was equally graphic. Um, but it always, is that, you can tell me I'm on crack if, if, you, if that's not something <laughs> that you, you No, no, but. I think it's key. I, it's, it's so important to me. Okay. So there's a, a great <laughs> deal of, of uh, explicit sexuality and explicit violence in, in the writing that I do, but not in the way you're thinking. Um, we've read them, so <laughs> I know what she's talking about. I read it. <laughs> um, in Chronology of Water, the abuse that my father inflicted on my family doesn't appear. And when I say it doesn't appear, what I mean is that there's no one sentence you could pluck out that says what he did to us, literally. And yet, when you get done reading a certain section or the book, you could say back to me what he did with some clarity and precision. And there are other books in the world that do name explicitly. I was just recently with a guy named Justin Torres who wrote We, we the Animals, and it's, oh, I love that book so much, it's crazy. <laughs> but there is an explicit details about what was literally done, but what I love entering and exploring is the idea that you can bring the reader close to the experience by activating what's true about their bodies. And just like you can stand um, close to an abstract painting, like a Rothko painting, like a big square of red. <laughs> Some people will walk away and go, whatever. But other people like me will stand there and cry for two hours because something resonated in me physically that communicated directly. So if I can get a reader sitting there reading the book to feel in their body this space of trauma and violence without actually harming them, that's important to me. So that's one thing. But in Small Backs of Children, I wrote about a little girl who lives through every horror you can imagine of a war zone like the worst horrors of a war zone because the bodies of women and children are used as raw material in war zones. But we talk about soldiers. Uh, and so the idea was to elevate the bodies of women and children in a war zone and uh, bring their stories back to them so that they're not just the fodder or the collateral damage or the raw material for the actions of male soldiers. Uh, and so that was a different approach to violence and transgression against bodies. But I'm always asking, how is the reader in their body? Mm -hmm. And how can I speak to you? Rather than, how can I put some violent, scary shit on a page and sell some books? That isn't the question. It's, can I reach you in your body? Um, and yet not on purpose harm you? It's a good question to struggle with. If you're a writer, I think it's a great question to struggle with. What are you doing on the page and why? Yep. Being a reader, a writer, a thinker, this is a question I hadn't planned on us, but I'm actually really curious. How do you feel about trigger warnings? Oh, I suck. <laughs> I suck. So my mentors were Ken Kesey and Kathy Acker. <laughs> so I have the non-politically correct attitude about trigger warnings. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel bad about it. I, um, I, both, like, I mean, it's probably, I feel both ways. I think that it's respectful 
to have compassion when a group of people are about to be subjected to things that are hard. Like, I get that. That sounds reasonable. And then I've been writing transgressive art my entire life, and I've moved through the world loving with my entire body transgressive art, that um, art that happens to you. And, and I believe in art that happens to you, where you don't get a warning. So can we go back to the days where there was such a thing as being able to hold more than one thing in your head at a time? Remember that? Remember nuance? <laughs> does anybody, does anybody remember? <laughs> like you could go this and this. <laughs> uh, so maybe I carry both in my head. I don't use them when I teach. Although sometimes I, I act gentle. <laughs> so maybe I do it a little bit. <laughs> And I'm getting older and I see, I see that the pain can be real. I see it. Yeah. I'm most careful around disenfranchised people. Um, privileged people in a classroom, for instance, they can get over it. <laughs> they can like go read some other books and go have a glass of wine and a nap or something. <laughs> when I'm, I mean, I work um, sometimes with people who are in or have been to prison or are coming out of tough refugee situations or think, you know, so I care about it much more when it's with groups of disenfranchised people than I do when I'm in a university classroom <laughs> where I'm like, you're in college. <laughs> Suck it up. <laughs> I'm just being honest. You don't have to like me or my answer, but that's where I'm at with it. You mentioned Ket. Oh, oh. You mentioned Ken Kesey a minute ago, and I, I, thinking about that, I, I, I had Robert Kelly as a professor in college, and he kept berating me, like, lengthen your lines, lengthen your lines. And that's how I became a fiction writer instead of a poet. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering what, what legacy, legacy of, of Ken Kesey you carry in your work, or what advice you carry. Yeah. he. he in a moment when we were alone, I thought something bad was going to happen. Something bad didn't happen, and he just turned to me and looked me in the eye and said, never surrender. Inside a moment I thought was going to be eroticized and male teacher going after young blonde woman thing. Inside that very moment is when he said that. And all my biases and shitty little <laughs> attitudes fell off. Um, and I followed that advice. I am still following that advice. And implicit in, because we've talked about it when he was live, implicit inside the never surrender is, um, you do have a vision. Um, you do actually know what you're doing. And if you give your vision away, you gave away the one thing that was yours. So even if you're going to run into a bunch of walls and people telling you to do it differently or you're not doing it right, which I've been told my entire life, by the way, every book, every story, every class, every degree, um, you do know how to do it. And you have to insist on it, even in the face of no, even in the face of you're doing it wrong. So the never surrender has a lot in it, I think. Thank you, I'm keeping that. <laughs> um, what are you writing now? What are you working on? <sighs> <laughs> I'm finishing up some edits that were supposed to already be done on a short story collection, and I'm supposed to be partway through a new novel. <laughs> Tell no one. <laughs> it's all here. <laughs> I am carrying the novel around in my stomach. I do have the ideas, and it's, it's there. <laughs> yeah, I carry them back here. Yeah, so. wherever it is on your body, it's there. I have it. You have it. It has not manifested upon yes. the page. <laughs> but so, it's, a, it's a, um, a novel I've, I waited. I waited. To write 
like I had the idea a very long time ago, but I needed to be this age. And this body, I like to say, because um, I'm so anti-celebrity culture and anti-beauty culture, <laughs> um, I am the exact size, weight, and shape I need to be to write the next book I need to write. So. Yeah. <laughs> so there are people out here right now who are exactly the right size and shape to I ask know, you questions. I know, I see them. <laughs> We're turning it over to you guys. What questions do you have for Lydia? Um, I'm wondering, like, when writing particularly about childhood memories, there's a mic guy, or you can share my chair with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I. Given how variable memory is, as you talked about, and particularly when writing about early childhood memory, but then needing to sort of encode it in a book via memoir, how do you, how do you navigate that? How do you make decisions about um, what to include and kind of put out there as facts as far as you know them? Um, do you, I don't know, how do, you, how do you write memory without putting a premium on your memories? Yeah. Uh, well, this is going to sound creepier than I mean it to. <laughs> However, <laughs> I'm less interested in the facts as they occurred. And I'm much more interested in this thing I was trying to talk about a little bit earlier. Can I get an individual reader? I'm pointing at you. Is it okay? Can I get an individual reader closer to my kid essence? like the colors and the smells and the retinal flashes I can see. Can I get this reader close to that? I care a lot more about that than can I get this reader to interpret these facts as they occurred on this day in June. I'm less interested in that. Can I get her to remember, do I I'd use the she pronoun? Can I get her to remember her childhood and the smell of oranges and asphalt? And it doesn't matter so much if I get the shoes I was wearing wrong, if we're both in this kid space for a second where things were true in the way that they are for kids. I care more about that. And the longer I write, the more I care about that, and the less I care about. I shall now catalog the events. Is <laughs> it because who who gives a shit? I mean, what mattered in Chronology of Water is that this male force tried to kill us every day of our lives, and we didn't die. So I could tell stories about going to cut down a Christmas tree, or learning to try to bike and move close to a reader and say, isn't it great we didn't die? And that's a bigger deal to me than what he literally did. Does that even answer your question a little bit? Uh, so, better way to say it, maybe release your grip on the tyranny of truth and try, try exploring physical and emotive integrity and reality. Try to get to the essence of experience through writing and art, and your reader will go there with you. I'll read it. He's, he's, Hurry up. Coming over with the mic. Oh, wow. I held mic. Um, you just inspired me to do something I didn't think I had the courage to do. I ripped off a tiny piece of paper in my classroom that students were writing on the, the tables that had paper on them in this art and learning teach I, class I teach. Yeah. And I had one of the two male students in the class had said, you don't treat me the same as the other, the women who come in late too. And I saw it was his writing. He'd written, you, you're incompetent. 
meaning me. And I tore this little, I was taking pictures of all the writing and all the, how tired everyone was and these, these sad eyes and this like overwhelming, you know, school culture. I don't know why, I just document like that. And then I saw this and I ripped it out. So everything else is there except this one little, she's incompetent. And I think I'm going to project it. I want to show all the pictures of their writing and project it. And I don't know what I'm going to say, but I just want to say, yeah, I'm incompetent sometimes at, you know, knowing what to do with, all, like, lateness and coming in stone and, you know, how to, how to deal with it. So thank you for maybe putting that idea in my head. Oh. I hear you. And so maybe that's a portal. Uh, over there. You know, the word, the space, because in the misfit gibberish I do, <laughs> I have turned it around and asked myself, what if my failures and my mistakes and my misfittery are all portals? instead of how I've been thinking of them my whole life, as I'm fucking up, or I'm not good, or I'm not right. And the day I figured out they might be portals, that meant I could go through them and go see what's in there. And it opens, instead of making me feel bad about myself. I bet you're an amazing teacher. Thank you for not giving up on them. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I can't remember how I bumped into your website, but <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that um, I started reading a part of it, and the first thing I read was, I think gender and sexual sexuality are territories of possibility. And at that time of my life, I felt that I was being screwed up by the gender cliches. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about that phrase um, today? Yes, I still think that. It's just blown up and gotten bigger for me. And I've also gotten a little crankier. <laughs> now I think gender is a hoax. I think we've been lied to. <laughs> I'm pissed off about it, and I want to see the man in charge. <laughs> I mean, I think those things, I think gender and sexuality are the, like these giant explorations we still have, you know, yet to finish exploring. And what stops us is what we're told about who we should be. And if we ever, like, as a group, especially if I give everybody berets. <laughs> if we ever as a group decided to go exploring, you know, not to shock anyone, not to necessarily transgress or turn everyone into kink monsters, but just explore what is sexuality and gender? What might it be? What, what portal is that? That would be amazing. That would be truly amazing. Maybe we will. Mm hmm Thank you. More questions, more questions. I'm not trying to turn everyone into a kink monster. No, I'm not either. <laughs> well, kink monsters are also good, we decided up here. But <laughs> just wanted to add that. I just wanted to say quickly that you did a really lovely job as a questioner, and your ring is exquisite. <laughs> and uh, I just, I'm going to remember that. I just like the way you asked the questions. And then, for um, author Lydia, um, through a really dark time, I had a um, family dynamic situation that was just awful. Two older brothers, a father that I used to think was the devil. I'm sorry. Um, but the, the quick scene in Dora, I don't know if I'm remembering this right, is somehow I remember it being a vacuum, a mother and a young man. Um, but I'm not sure if that's really even I'll in the book. It. <laughs> but it's anymore, just because I'm nervous. So I'm. But I I love the book Dora, and it really helped to give me that electrical charge to keep going. Yeah, she uh, that character did that for me too. I think we all have a Dora inside of us, who helps us get through. Who's the teen punk, who could who fight her way out of anything and. Um, she helps me too. That character was a big deal to me. Yeah. And I also read the Croy Stage book. 
Yeah, the first time I read that case history of hysteria, I, I think I was 22 or three and I threw it against the wall. <laughs> and then that wasn't enough, I went over and picked it up and chewed on it. So I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> it's like, bite it. And I didn't even really understand what I was so mad about till later in life, but I, I knew, my body knew, I was like, ah, <laughs> bad. Thank you for saying that though. That book isn't, not very many people have read it, but it was super important to me personally. I think it was one of those um, uh, get you through a door of your life books. Um, so thank you. Is the caller there? <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm trying to write about motherhood. And oh. you know, and it's really hard. Yes. And it's full of, you know, my life's regrets and guilt. So you're helping me, you know, trying to say fuck 'em. Yeah. But what 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 can you tell me about your motherhood that would help me? Gah, it's so hard, isn't it? Motherhood is, a one, is another one of those words and concepts and places of a locked story. Like, you're not allowed to say certain things or be certain things because the motherhood story already exists and you better fit in it or you're fucked. Uh, but I think of it as another one of those portal, like vast territories of experience we have yet to talk about, write about, make art about, vast. Because we've been trying so hard to be the version we were told to be which we all fail at, by the way. It's literally impossible to make, be that story. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it. Um, so, A, I just need you to hurry up and finish that <laughs> because we are in dire need of uh, multiplication and expansion of whatever it is we mean when we say motherhood. Uh, probably not limited to women, even though that makes people uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, but that, talk, about, talk about a realm that needs to be opened up. I'm lucky in that my first experience of motherhood, I'm going to say a sad thing, trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> my first experience of motherhood carried life and death in it at the same moment. And in some ways, I'm lucky because it opened up the idea so radically and profoundly for me that I, I detached from my cultural scripts about it entirely. And my understanding of being and birth and death do not happen on a linear timeline. They are not Christian. Uh, the metaphysics of being and birth and death being probably closer to Buddhist um, or something we haven't discovered yet that kind of mixes what we know about astrophysics and philosophies and theologies that aren't organized religion based. We're getting closer to some, some way of knowing that's about we are energy and matter in time. Um, and so motherhood in those terms, you know, how is it about being, how is it about knowing, how is it about existence rather than did I fuck my kid up, did I live a good life? <laughs> you know, I think we've made the question so small it just feels like writing about a failure and that's not true. It's an existence. Life passes through our bodies that's still so huge. Who cares who, the be who won the best mom award? I, I literally don't care who the best mom is or what the best mom advice is. Life passes through our bodies. That's so huge. So maybe, in, it feels like I'm not answering your question, but if I had any advice, the advice would be keep opening and multiplying rather than distilling and getting smaller about what kind of mother you've been keep opening it to bigger questions. And hurry. <laughs> and so opening to the bigger questions is actually where we are now because we're at the end of our hour. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. I especially, especially a million times a million want to thank Lydia for, for everything that she had to say. So